So yeah, welcome, Bruce. Great to have you here. It's a total yeah. pleasure to have you on the podcast. Um, welcome anyone who is watching us on the Facebook live stream. And to anyone watching the recording, welcome to you as well. Um, yeah, tonight's my great pleasure to welcome Bruce Franklin. Uh, Bruce has an amazing career in producing and production management um, spanning many years and many amazing projects um, just going from your wall behind you, the Adams Family, Avatar, the Smurfs. Um, and I've also worked with you on, on a couple of things, including Jungle Book and um, this Ghost in the Shell. So, so many titles to mention. Um, and you've worked on uh, movies and TV. And um, I know you've done a number of other things with your life as well. Anyway, um, welcome. Great to have you here, Bruce. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I would not have guessed that this is where my career would take me, but um, I've been fortunate enough to be in the right place at the right time for some of this virtual production stuff as it was developing. And uh, yeah, I think my history from coming from animation and then moving into live action visual effects uh, and having the great fortune to land on some of these shows you mentioned uh, has given me sort of a unique perspective on what works, what doesn't, how complicated this stuff can get, that kind of thing. So I'm happy, and I'm yeah. happy to share that. Excellent. Well, yeah, I mean, maybe a, a good place to start is to kind of start from the beginning and, and talk a little bit about how, how you ended up in this crazy business. Well, uh, it's a long and tangled story for those people who may be watching that are wondering how to get started in this crazy business. Uh, I actually started out as an aeronautics major. I wanted to be a Navy pilot. And that plan changed when I was in my 20s. And then I thought, well, what's the next amazing thing I could do that would be so great I couldn't imagine getting paid for? And it was a you know, movie star. So hence, I became a theater major and started, you know, came down to L.A. and was going to try and be an actor. And then I did some of that. And I did some, you know, some plays and some creative stuff. I really enjoyed it. There were some things about it I really liked. Uh, I found that I was drawn to the production side of things like stage lighting, um, development, story development, things like that. Uh, and as a part of trying to be a better actor and understanding what happens on a film set, I thought, well, I should go volunteer to do some film set stuff so I at least understand the language and the world I'm operating in and, you know, the interface between the craft and production because... You know, it's not just art, it's art and commerce, right? Um, and what I discovered was I really like production and I, I seem to have some talent for it. So I sort of never looked back. I thought, well, I don't want to be in my 40s and wonder if I'll ever buy a house. I think maybe this production thing's a good idea. <laughs> so, yeah, well, you definitely have proved that you are good at it. And uh, you're just your poster collection alone, but also you're a... <laughs> resume and imdb um and yeah it's really great to hear that you kind of ha had some um things that encouraged you and some some spark that kind of spoke to you about production because a, lo a lot of people who want to get into the business that see themselves as being a movie star or think about visual effects as being more glamorous than it really is behind the scenes <clears throat> and um yeah i think for a lot of people that the what you start off thinking you're going to be doing is quite different than what you end up doing. Um, right. Was it, so was there something in particular that kind of spoke to you uh, about it or um, was it more a collection of experiences or? Yeah, it, it was, a, it was something specific. I, I like I said, I, I really enjoyed acting and entertainment and creating a performance that moved people um, I've always believed, uh, I was also a lit major in college, so I always believe that human beings understand their world through stories. You know, we think we have facts and ideas, and then we make decisions about stuff, and that's kind of really not what we do. You know, what we do is we have an experience, and then we post hoc rationalize it and build a story around it as to why it happened and what it meant, right? So that's why all of our traditions, our historical traditions were oral. It was the the combined wisdom of like what it took to get through life and how to interpret things. And the modern expression of that is entertainment in Hollywood. So it really is, I think, core to what's important to people 
to communicate things that matter and how to relate to life. And you do that through stories. So that was one of the things that drew me to acting. When I started doing production, what I realized was what I really enjoy, what really lights me up is being a person who can organize and support a complicated team of people doing something fairly difficult over a long period of time. And right. that kind of facilitation like, is a great skill set to have. And there aren't enough people who know how to do it. Like, and I mean, I can tell you from a visual effects standpoint, as visual effects take a bigger and bigger piece of all entertainment, you know, every show that you'd never think as visual effects now has visual effects in it, right? That means you need more and more visual effects people. And there simply aren't enough qualified, experienced visual effects people is particularly in management, coordinator, a key coordinator, PA, production manager, producer, right? Yeah. It's, uh, uh, I have a much harder time taking a vacation than I do finding a job. Right. So, I mean, from that perspective, in the entertainment space, like it's kind of a growth field because I don't see, I don't see it slowing down. I don't see people using less visual effects, right? It seems that way, yeah. Yeah, and, and some of those uh, positions that you mentioned are presumably good ways in to moving up the ladder as you have to um, being you know, a producer and, and some of the higher up positions of, of um, essentially project management of uh, building entertainment experiences. Um, and is it, is there, how did you get your, your break or, um, was there kind of a, an initial thing that you jumped into? Or was it, um, there was, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily call it a break, but, um, as I said, I was like going to college and being a student and being an actor and ha always had my day job, which was a holdover from my aerospace wannabe days. And I basically worked at an airline. So I was like, loading luggage and, you know, driving a forklift or, and whatnot all the way through school. Uh, and, and then for a time I was both working at the airport and trying to do low budget, you know, like independent filmmaking and learn how to like break down a script and production manage a little project and things like that. But that's, that stuff is very difficult to get going in because everybody wants to do it and nobody's got any money or any experience. So the projects yep. are usually terrible and you can learn some stuff, but it's almost luck and happenstance that you fall into one that actually works. Right. So I got to a point where I thought, well, I really need to quit my day job and either dedicate myself to this full time or just admit the fact that I'm going to be working at the airport. And so right. I actually left, uh, left entertainment, left my forklift job, and a friend of mine gave me an opportunity outside the entertainment industry to production manage software development. Right. And I thought, well, you know, it, it's, you know, it's a break and I'll learn something and it's a transferable skill set and we'll see how it goes. I did that for a couple of years, went to project management school. It was great. I learned some skills I still use. And then I realized like, I'm just not passionate about delivering software projects. I can do it. I understand the language now, but I really want to go back and work in movies. Right. <laughs> yeah. But, because at the end of the day, like we're not curing cancer, we're just making cool cartoons. But at the end of the day, I can look at it and be like, Hey, look what we did. That's cool. You know, that's, that's what I like about this business. It's really so, important. Yeah. To have a, have a passion for what yeah. you're doing otherwise your work really feels like work and you really know notice time and you're, you're waiting for the end of the day and, and as opposed to um you know having 14 hours go by and all of a sudden you realize it's night time and, and yeah it's it's super important i think it's it's difficult to to achieve sometimes but noticing what what you're passionate about and really going for it is um is the way it seems like that's what you did and you stayed true to to what you wanted to do you had yeah. a little side turn in software i can totally relate to that i was a software engineer for uh, a good number of years in software architect and i um wasn't really that passionate about delivering software projects either <laughs> so i had a similar very similar experience in wanting to jump out of that world and and back into movies 
Yeah. So when I did, when I made that decision and I came back to LA, I thought, well, what I was doing before wasn't working. So now what? And that was when I thought was thinking like, well, this visual effects thing is going to start taking a bigger, bigger piece of the footprint of all of entertainment. Knowing how to manage a technical pipeline like that is probably a useful skill to have, maybe give me some opportunities. And then I realized that uh, animation, pure like CG animation is the ultimate expression of all of that whole toolkit, right? Because with visual effects, you do all kinds of cool stuff, but you get 80% of your pixels for free out of the camera. And with animation, like you got to build everything. Yep. So I started temping my way around. I basically took a job as a temp and I was like answering phones for people and, you know, barely able to pay my rent and, you know, struggling through my mid thirties. Cause I, you know, like I said, I did the airline job for a while out of college. Um, but I finally was temping at uh, DreamWorks Animation and the head of operations and finance was like, okay, you can stay, you know, do you want to stay? And I said, yes. I told him I wanted to be in production and he said, okay, but give me a year, give me a year on the desk and I will endorse you going into production. So it's basically what I did. I was an assistant for a year. Then I was a coordinator on two or three animated movies, two and a half. And then I thought, okay, I kind of get it. I think I want to go do live action. Hmm. And I just put it out there. I just put, you know, told people I was looking and put it out there and said, Hey, I'm, you know, if anybody's looking for a coordinator. Um, and the producer on the show I was on at DreamWorks said, Oh, Hey, I heard you're looking blah, blah, blah. I have a friend who's doing this movie. She's looking for a coordinator. She's really great. You should go talk to her. It's this thing called avatar. All right. Wow. Yeah. And, I didn't know what it was. I would look it up on IMDb. It was like, oh, James Cameron, right. Titanic, The Abyss. And like, I heard, you know, I heard they're hard, but sure, I'm sure I'll learn a lot and it'll be a great experience, right? Well, little did I know. Uh, that was probably one of the hardest jobs I've ever done because uh, I went from cord like asset coordinator to visual effects coordinator to visual effects production manager over a two-year period through that project. Uh, but man, I got a front row view of like bleeding edge filmmaking. I saw uh, my first day on the job when they greenlit down in Playa del Rey. I walked out on stage and they were doing virtual camera, which we can probably talk about the details of that if people aren't familiar with it. But yeah, he was doing virtual camera on a sequence. So they had captured the motion and edited together the what I would call previs, you know, fancy previs. And the actors were gone. And he was out there in the volume with a markered camera running the scene and looking through his little monitor on the steering wheel and putting camera on the sequence. And he put camera on an entire sequence in like two and a half hours. And I thought, oh my God, that would take six to eight weeks through at least three departments in an animation pipeline. That's right, yeah. To get through like rough layout to establish the camera final layout to get at least blocking and timing and that you know like and and you'd have to storyboard it before that and you'd have two directors going through all of these meetings in each one of those phases to get to the point where you had even a rough animatic and absolutely he, he, yeah. he did it on a sequence in two and a half hours and i thought okay this is this is here to stay because that like that is amazing uh and it's it's been you know, off the races from there. I had the fortune to work on Jungle Book, which was probably even more complicated than Avatar. Uh, I yeah, it was. Uh, a, I guess it was a a bit of a jigsaw puzzle having that many vendors working on it. Those five or maybe more vendors. No, we had on Avatar. You mean on uh, Jungle Book? Oh, Jungle Book. Uh, Jungle Book was mainly NPC, although as you know, DD was doing the. The, yeah. uh, running the motion capture front end and all the all the digital artists right yeah but i was working with dd on that show the vast majority of the visual effects work was all done at uh mpc and we we did have a couple of other players who came in and helped us with uh, for again these these descriptions are a little don't exactly apply but for what i would say previs like to get our previs ready for to yeah and over to the mpc uh magnopus was one of the companies that worked, did some really great work on the show um, but Avatar had 
10 vendors in five time zones. Wow. And, you know, most of it was Weta, like 1,500 of the 2,300 shots were Weta, but the other 800 shots were nine vendors in, in like four or five time zones. So, yeah, it was a multi-headed beast of a thing to wrangle. Right. So, so Avatar was more complex. Uh, it was more complex in terms of number of vendors. Yeah. But I think the pipeline on Jungle Book was more complicated in terms of figuring right. out how to motion capture you know, proxy animals, right? And Avatar had a six month live action shooting period in New Zealand. There was, you know, 20% of the movie was live action. Jungle Book, the entire live action shoot was essentially a glorified element shoot for the kid. Yeah. Right. And everything else is virtual production, pre viz, post viz, and visual effects. You know, Every right. environment, every character, every weather change, everything, everything. Yeah, and it took, um, well, Avatar, it's, uh, I mean, virtual production goes back even further than that, sure. really, back to Lord of the Rings, or if you're being really nitpicky, you know, 100 years ago with uh, rear projection, you know, certain mm -hmm. elements of it have been being done for a long time. But um, really, like, Avatar was uh, did a tremendous amount for it to... to um, to innovate and create the tools that are used today and then Jungle Book more and Lion King even more. And yeah, it's continuing to evolve today. Yeah, and to, to your point, like all of these tools existed. People had done motion capture. People have been using motion capture in video games for eons, right? Yeah. But it was the combination of the off the shelf technologies and then figuring out how to stitch them together so that you could motion capture and this is and this is what makes it complicated, more complicated than than live action is live action. You do all your prep, you get there on the day, you get what you get in the camera, right? And after that, it's an editorial problem. In virtual production, you think that you're saving all this time and making it way more efficient, which in some ways you are, but it doesn't alleviate all of those artistic and creative decisions. What does the world look like? What are the environmental designs? How are we gonna light this thing, right? They actually pull those decisions forward into pre-production. You actually have to do more design, more look development, and more decision-making in, in pre-production than you do on a traditional film. So it doesn't really save you any effort per se, it just front loads it so that the back end where it is just heavy lifting in production is a little smoother. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and allows the, the filmmakers to be in part of the process even more as well. And right. Allowing them into the conversation, not having to just be over somebody's shoulder, directing them using a mire on a box uh, at a desk in a, in a post house. They can actually create a stage and have people there and helping them, but being able to actually do that work and like James Cameron was doing doing the cameras himself and then being able to adjust things while they're doing that which before was kind of impossible yeah and I will say one of the interesting things about Avatar was uh, that was where I learned the importance of facial capture because motion capture is great right but video games look like video games for a reason there's you don't get all the nuance in the facial performance and the tools to do really good facial capture were just being developed. And so there were all kinds of hacks and kludges and workarounds and stuff to try and get the facial capture work. Uh, largely, uh, a lot of it, a lot of those problems were solved by Glenn Derry and his team, the guys who made the head rigs and, and set up the cameras. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that's one of the things that makes it unique is you actually get the facial nuance that makes it look like the actual actor and not just an animated character, you know? And that's the thing about motion capture. With animation, you have to animate every keyframe, right? And then spline the in-betweens. In motion capture, you get all of that information frame to frame from the actor. And that's, that's not something somebody could hand animate. Although they do have to go adjust it and finesse it and, you know, stitch things together and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah, it was a, a pretty incredible movie. I remember, seeing it or so seeing the promotion material for it and thinking wow that looks that sounds like a really exciting thing and then when it came out 
it really really was you know transported everybody into a, another world and most people I, I even heard of people having problems coming back from it and finishing you know the, finishing the movie and accepting the real world afterwards that it was it was that good um yep, yep. and i i had a couple of experiences one was the day when i started and i saw uh james cameron put the camera on an entire sequence in two hours and the other one was, you know, you work on this stuff for months and weeks and years, and you see every iteration go by as it's developed, right? And, you know, animation and grayscale and all the things. And then eventually you see a lighting scene that, where the shots have been lit. And I remember seeing the first passes of some of the, the animals, the flying animals, all the hot, you know, really colorful animals and the nighttime bioluminescent scenes. Mm. And I'd been staring at this stuff for a year. And I was like, I was the first day I was like, Oh, now I get it. You know, the d designs that I saw, like, wow, that guy had this in his head the whole time. Right. You know, and I think that's one of the things is it, um, that filmmakers like about it. We had, you know, everybody from Tom Cruise to Spielberg to, you know, uh, many other A-list filmmakers come out to like see and play with the technology. And the, the takeaway was like, oh, my God, these guys haven't been able to actually handle a camera since film school. You know, and then here they are out there, like on a stage making movies and being able to do really complicated visual effects. But in a controlled environment. And not right. be directing a stage play or just directing an actor against a green screen where they don't know what they're reacting to or whatever. So, yeah, it's very powerful for the filmmakers. In fact, on Jungle Book, uh, you I remember Bill Pope, our DP. Yeah, I believe that was his first vir uh, virtual production. And at the beginning, he was like, OK, somebody explain this to me. I'm not sure. You know, I wasn't real sure he was going to love it. Right. By about a third of the way through that thing, he realized that his photography, his camera on the show was happening in the virtual camera pavilion, not out on the stage with the actor. And so he that's where he lived. By the end of that show, he loved virtual production. Because right. I, I gave him all kinds of crazy flexibility that you could do on the fly. Yeah. Yeah, same, I'd say for uh, Caleb Deschanel and Lion King as well. He, ne he'd he not really even worked on a particularly big uh, visual effects movie, uh, no, particularly. He was more traditional, but um, they wanted to bring him in and be a, him have his, his, you know, decades of experience and incredible eye for filmmaking and be able to work in that space. And, you know, he's um, someone who's in the seventies as well. And it re was able to pick this up really quickly and, and fell in love with it too. It's, I think that's some of the, the magic and that's being able to do it this. Kind of, it kind of cross pollinates the high technology sort of slightly uh, uh, abstract post-production visual effects with like, real nuts and bolts photography storytelling uh, they did the same stuff at dreamworks where they brought in some really good live action dps to help them light their cg scenes in a way that captured filmic lighting so that the blacks it was okay let the blacks crush it's okay let the highlights blow out but get photographic exposure instead of that like perfect cg lighting where you can right. see every pixel you know and movies like lion king Avatar, Jungle Book, Endgame, they really land that stuff. Yeah. You know, it's the best of both worlds. Yeah. What's it like from, um, we had a, a couple of questions coming in. Um, I just wanted to ask you, what, what's it like from a sort of uh, production perspective, from a producer's perspective, working on movies like this that are so experimental and all like kind of don't really know how they're going to get it done at the beginning um and start with that kind of understanding a lot, a lot of i guess a lot of a lot of filmmaking has components of that in it whether you're just shooting live action or if you're doing visual effects there's always some unknowns but with these where it's just so cutting edge and this it's so brand new there's so many things that are brand new all at the same time um what's that like as a as a producer to kind of step into that. Well, so for the bigger shows that I've been on, particularly Avatar, Jungle Book, and uh, Endgame, uh, and Infinity Wars, I was a production manager, not a producer. Right. Um, I will say that my experience is that production managing is actually harder 
than producing uh, because you have to be so deep into the details of everything, schedule, budget, crew management, you know, remembering all the details, managing the vendors, like all the things, right? But when you're, to your question, in cases where you're working on a project where they're using all this bleeding edge stuff, but they're not sure how the puzzle pieces are even going to fit together, right? That really is pretty much every film project. Like you start with the script. I mean, and there's oftentimes people flying in script pages on the day, right? Your call time's 8 a.m. You're not getting new script pages until 10. And it's a big visual effects scene. And you're like, we have to prep for this. We got to know like how many green screens and whether or not we need a motion control rig and like all the, we got to have the right people and like, okay, make it up, you know, make it up as you go, man. So I think that, ha that aspect of it happens all over. There's only so much you can manage. Yeah. Um, but there are some things you can do to plan a project to design a structure that allows you to deal with all that complexity in a somewhat predictable way so that you can then roll with those things that are gonna happen anyway, you just don't know what they are yet uh, without right. it being like full-time, everybody on fire chaos. It's like, you're gonna have some long days, right? I think I did four months of 100 hour weeks on Avatar at, toward the tail end. Like, it's just, well, welcome to your job, bring a sleeping bag, you know, we got stuff to do. Right. Um, yeah. No time to go home. Yeah. No time to go home. Uh, now as a producer, I believe that it's possible to make projects boring and predictable in post right. and like not kill your crew and like, like make it manageable. And what I believe is that by making it manageable, you're actually providing leverage to the filmmakers to get actually what they want creatively on the screen instead of chasing fires all the time and then you just run out of calendar and you get what you get, you know? Uh, so to approach these from a producing standpoint, it really you know, starts out with the script, read the script and have enough familiarity with how visual effects works and virtual production works to parse out like what are the, what are the most likely strategies to accomplish this stuff? Where am I really going to need motion capture? Where can I do like traditional green screen? Where are these like uh, rear projection LED screens? Like where is that useful and where isn't it? Um, yeah. Because for me, my experience is virtual production is an incredibly powerful tool that is capable of amazing things, right? It's also not the right tool for every job. Yep. It's complicated. It's expensive. And sometimes it's like a... For example, on uh, Infinity Wars and Endgame, Marvel uh, had some experiences on, on a previous show where they're doing a very complicated action scene and they're shooting actors on a 200 foot green screen in the middle of somewhere in Atlanta. And they're chasing the sun throughout the day with their setups, right? And at some point the directors were like, wait a minute, are we, we're looking at this guy. Are we looking at the, at the airport in the background or are we looking the other, like what's actually back there right now? Cause I can't tell. Yeah. If they don't know what's back there, they're not exactly sure like how to frame the shot, how long to hold the camera, right? So it's important. So they thought, well, if we had some of these virtual production tools, you know, maybe we could solve that problem. And when you do something like a uh, simulcam where you can look through the lens and see your CG environment, your, uh, your, your post-vis CG environment that you've built in your virtual lab, 50-50 opacity with, with the live action set and the actors and camera, you can actually frame your shots, right? Super cool. But that, to be able to do that, requires 30 guys from Weta, two leapfrogging motion capture volumes that have to be torn up and put up and, and built up like as the sets move around. And it's like, you know, 15, 20, 30, 40 million dollars overhead to add to the show. So only big shows can do it, right? Yep. Yeah. And in that case, it all came down to that process is you have to allow time for the process, right? Hey, uh, we have to reboot the computers for this take. It's going to take five or 10 minutes, right? Well, that may happen six times a day. Okay, there's an hour your shoot day gone, right? At Marvel, they had 16 A-list actors they had to shoot out on a schedule. And like their key to success is velocity. They cannot slow down. 
And if your virtual production's like, oh, wait, well, we had a hiccup, we got to we got to reset or whatever, the ads are going to say thanks, but no thanks. We're going to move on and shoot it traditionally. You can catch up on the next take, right? right? But that means you're spending all this money and time and effort, and you're only really going to get about 75% of what you thought, right? Which, okay, where's the, you know, where's the calculus and how does that work? Um, so the ultimate decision on that trail was, this is not the right tool for these directors because they really need to move fast. And it's a better use of the resources to focus down, do a little bit of virtual production on the very important stuff that you sort of can't live without and then do what we know how to do with green screens and whatnot on the rest of it. And so I spent three months basically talking myself out of a job, but that was the right thing to do for that project, right? They, right. It would have been a mistake for the Russo brothers to, to go down that path. It would, have, it would have hampered their filmmaking. So it's not right. for anything. Um, the other is thing, there, is, sorry, go sorry, ahead. I was just gonna say, is it, um, are there things, I guess, some things you can do ahead of time to try and work that out or otherwise just accept that you're going to get into it and find it out when you're in the show when you're actually filming uh, i'm sorry the, the, i guess can you restate the question are, are they <clears throat> how much can you kind of work out ahead of time how much can you kind of know about the process that they want to um use know what they like know what tools are going to be successful versus actually finding out when you're kind of using them and throwing some of them away or adding some back in. So some of it is just like judgment and experience. Like on Avatar, uh, you know, it's kind of not fair because from a producing standpoint, uh, those shows are going to take as long as they take and they're going to cost as much as they cost and really nobody can manage it. Like you just, you're just along for the ride and you're, you're going to keep going until you're done. And that's your metrics of success is don't stop. You know, yep. when you get onto other show and, but only a few directors and showrunners have the clout to have that kind of freedom. Right. And so on the one hand uh, it was difficult, but it was great because we only had to do one thing, which was give Jim everything he wanted. Right. right. And that's, you know, he, even if he changes his mind, you've only got one master to listen to. And that was, that's great. Right. On other shows, there's just other considerations. And I think it's a matter of experience to be able to look at the directors and the schedule, break down the script. Um, let me back up a step. Normally what I do is I'll break down a script and I'll sort of take my first rough pass at what are they asking for us to do here? How much of this is in my wheelhouse? And some rough, vague stab at like, how many resources I'm gonna need? How long is it gonna take? What's my relationship and my interaction with the live action department's gonna be? Then you gotta go talk to the other departments and say, hey, this is kind of what we're thinking. You, you know, how are you guys gonna operate? How are you gonna move your sets around? How do you wanna coordinate your physical set builds with our digital builds if they both have to marry up at the end? And then through that process of evolution, you, I, we sort of realized like, ah, actually, yes, we could do this. Um, but just based on the shooting schedule alone and the other priorities of the main production, the net result of what was a proper motion capture or virtual production front end plan educated them to the fact that that was, they needed to go a different route. So to your point, you, some of it, you have to have the experience, at least if you're going to produce it, right? If you're going to produce it, you probably ought to have done it a few times and have some intuition about what's going to work and what's not going to work. Um, but then the rest of it, when you get into it, like I said, um, I have like an 80, 20 rule. If you have 80% of the information and you're 80% confident that you're right, plus or minus 20%, go, you can't wait for the last 20% of detail and information, or you'll never finish. Right. And you have to accept the fact that it's a creative process. Things are going to change out from under you. And some percentage of your work, hopefully you can contain it to 10 or 15%, which is kind of reasonable of like wastage, right? We did it, it didn't work. We tried six things, we went, went down a rabbit hole, came back, whatever it was. Um, but yeah, you wanna try and keep it as contained as you can, but the process is gonna do what it does. And it really, right. a lot of it, it depends on your filmmakers. Who are they? How big a star are they? How much money are they playing with? 
right? And above a certain scale, you know, John Favreau is going to get what he wants. The visual effects department isn't going to reel him in based on their budget. You know, now from a producing standpoint, that's actually kind of nice because it just means, you know, as as new ideas are invented and the and the creative goals change, all we have to do is do what he needs on a day to day, and if Disney doesn't want to pay for it, they can talk to him. Yeah, you know, and that's a conversation they should have, and that's great. You know, and sometimes you know the vast majority of the time, he's still going to get what he wants, so that's great. You just got to keep going. On smaller shows like some of the episodics I've done, the budget constraints are a lot tighter, and the the dynamics are different. In episodic, you have a showrunner who straddles the creative intent for the entire series to keep it in the flavor of the show and the tone and you know sort of guide the whole thing. But each individual episode may have a different director. On a live on a live action visual effects feature, you work for the director. Your job is to give them what they want through the whole process, right? On an episodic, the directors come in, they do their director's cut, and they usually move on and go on with their next project. And then after that, it's up to the showrunner and the studio. And the studio, showrunner and the studio are the people who decide when the edit's done and all that stuff, which puts the studio much more involved in the day-to-day -day of, hey, we want to try this new thing. It's going to be X amount of overage, you know? the creative executives can weigh in and say, ah, you know, we don't really think there's bang for the buck there. We should just go this other way. And they can help you keep it contained and manage to a particular number. But uh, one of the best visual effects producers I ever worked for who did a ton of really big shows, uh, Joyce Cox, you've worked with her on Jungle Book. Yeah. She always said, you know, almost none of her project came in on budget. It's just, it's not a thing. It's, <laughs> There's so much R and D yeah. happening, right? And so much of laying the tracks while a train is moving. You make decisions with the best information you have, and then down the road you realize, oh, I, we actually underestimated how complicated this was, or something. Right. And but you're already you're already committed, so you've already spent so much money and time, like you just have to keep going. Yeah, and just finding yeah. it, finding the resources where you can along the way. Yeah, find the resource. Sometimes you can make intelligent trade offs. Yep. Sometimes you just got to call people and give them the bad news and say, it's going to be an overage. It's going to be an overage. <laughs> Let me know if we want to, you know, get on the phone about it. So speaking of uh, giving people what they want and uh, talking of James Cameron, um, question I'm sure you get asked a lot. What was it like working with him? Uh, I, I actually had a really good experience with him. Um, I mean, it was difficult in many ways. Um, I'm paraphrasing what some of my, my production manager at the time told me, but there are some things about the way he approaches filmmaking, uh, which are about like, it. if you're not up to changing the world, what are you doing here? Right. And in some sense, it should be like combat. Like everything is at stake and you're, you're, you're here to win or you're not. And so that, ethos it, like living with that ESA ethos is tough that's where you get months and months and months of you know 20 hour days right yeah um but seeing the result and seeing what you get when you have a singular dedicated creative vision who yeah. has the authority to get exactly what he wants without compromise right you end up with a movie that makes two billion dollars and looks amazing and people still talk about 10 years later Right. Yeah. I've also done smaller shows at studios where it was sort of being directed by committee at the studio and like, and it's just much less interesting movies or come out of the end of that. Right. So it was probably the best or the biggest single learning experience of my visual effects career. Uh, I think it really laid the groundwork for a lot of the stuff I've done since then. Like it was great for me. I don't, I, I would have to think carefully about repeating the, uh, repeating the process just because I've learned most of what I think I could get out of it. And I don't want to work hundred hour weeks. I don't, I don't want to at least five hours of sleep a night. Not yeah. Just I don't want to, I don't want to take, I don't want to say yes to supporting a project knowing that that's where it's going, no matter what, you know, cool. at some point. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
I get it. I want to work with good filmmakers. Uh, ideal, I mean, ideally, I want to pick projects where you have good filmmakers and it's and it's an achievable goal, and you can do it in a way, like I said, makes post production like boring and predictable, and provides them everything they want, every every creative pixel they want, they get. And I think that's possible. What um, um, what was I going to ask you? Um, from your perspective, um, so when when I as I said when I first got into visual effects, I didn't totally understand the whole thing really. Um, trying to put it together, trying to understand how to be a good artists, trying to understand what all the people were and what they were doing, understand producers. Um, what what in your eyes makes a good um producer what what are some of the qualities that or um producer or production manager um say producer what what makes the, what are the good qualities of, of a good producer i would say um the same skills that make a good leader in any endeavor right like good communication skills uh good team leadership awareness of morale um i think i think i mentioned communication um and attention to detail and and again some of it just really comes down to experience having whatever task you're in whether you're a pa or whatever spending enough time trying to get good at what you have to do day to day to be able to articulate to somebody else this is how this works right so and i guess there are different types of producer as well ones that who yeah. are more towards the the budget side ones are a bit more towards the creative side different yep. different types yeah and I, that's actually a really important point i um i originally when i first started getting into production thought like oh yeah i want to be a creative producer i want to be like you know the producer of producers and you know i'm gonna be the head of the producing food chain and then i got into visual effects and i like it and i'm staying but yeah. what i realized was visual effects producing is not like i have a creative opinion I've seen enough CG shots. I can make comments on them, and you know, I've seen enough animation. I can, I can make comment on that, right? But as a visual effects producer, that's fundamentally not what I get hired for, right? I'm an implementer. I get hired to run the machine that produces the result, and there's enough cooks in the kitchen. So, if you have a good relationship with your filmmakers and you have an opinion, and it's a, you know they like it, like they'll listen to you but my fundamental role is just to run the machine. And right. there's really not a good path from visual effects producer to leap over to creative producer. You have to, if you want to be a creative creative producer, you know, go do development or, or, or learn how to raise money or learn how to package talent. Right? Cause that's how you sort of assemble the project from the ground up. I get hired after the studio has already decided to do it. Now the advantage of that is that means they got a budget and my paychecks are going to clear yeah so there's a certain like there's a certain uh comfort like creative producing is very entrepreneurial being a visual effects producer you, you work for the studio really studio and the, and the and the filmmakers so it's a little simpler in that way which for me is a good thing you're also a very creative person and that's kind of what got you into this in the first place and i'm i'm sure that you have uh some outlets for your own creativity that allow you to kind of explore it and indulge in that in that side a lot i know that you're a uh D, D fan and things like that i'm sure uh um you know allow you to get that out of your system in some other ways yeah for sure like we, were, we were we were this close to getting favreau to join our D, &D game on jungle book <laughs> that would have been epic yeah what a story yeah well it's it's what the interesting thing is um there was, a, first of all, I didn't start playing Dungeons and Dragons until I was in my 30s. Hmm. There was a group at DreamWorks that was playing a game in the conference room on Thursday night. Hey, you, wanna, you know, it's like one of the IT guy and some of the guys and they're like, hey, uh, you should come play. So I was. So I met a group of guys working at DreamWorks that were D&D nerds that are still my friends, you know, all these years later. There was then another group on Avatar that turned out to be D&D &D guys 
who have all spawned off in different directions, but we still have a regular game. I'm still in touch with those guys, you know, and yeah, it just goes on. It's all the same people, you know, the people who are into gaming and fantasy and like, what else do you think a really good production designer who wants to work on Lord of the Rings is into? Yeah, it makes sense because you're you're really storytelling and, and world building and totally. it's all the same things that go into uh Favreau credits D and D for you know helping him um understand storytelling and, yeah. and develop it and um you know working on his movies so you can see that stuff everywhere i think he probably in, inspires it obviously people are already into it but there there was you know lion king particularly there was die everywhere you know all over the consoles and people were always playing it in the in the art room and that's cool yeah it's it, and it's a it's an interesting crossover that just doesn't seem to go away yeah so, yeah um and, and talking about uh, the qualities of what makes a good producer um i'd love to hear your your thoughts on what makes a good artist from a producer's point of view because when when i first started i didn't really understand that and i i developed an opinion that um, i wanted to try and kind of produce myself as much as possible to be a, as uh, as organized as i could and um you know be be good because when i when i realized how valuable producers were um i i wanted to help them and i wanted to you know do do well in that way and i wonder if you had any thoughts for artists on how to how to work well from a producer's point of view because sometimes i feel like there can be a, a little bit of a divide between artists and producers like the producers are kind of telling them what to do and they want to get on with it but there it's a wonderful um combination when it works really well and i wonder yep. if you had any advice for people in that way yeah, I sure. I, I really feel like, I mean, producing is a management job, right? So my job is to manage things, including people and throughput and, and you know, quota and whatever. And an artist is there to make art, right? To, uh, I, what, the advice I would give an artist is understand that you're in a big machine. You're a cog in the wheel. There's a lot of other considerations that have nothing to do with you. And you can focus on what is in your wheelhouse and try and make it beautiful, right? But ultimately you are doing a work for hire, which has to meet the brief of whoever owns the project, like the director. So if you are asked to do something and you think, well, that's not gonna work, <clears throat> right? But you have a better idea, that's great. Please feel free to give us the new idea or even show it to us but give us what we asked for first. So you can say, hey, I did what you wanted. I don't think it works because of this. Here's this other thing, what do you think? Yeah. Because now you're giving them options. Okay. So don't kind of like <clears throat> argue the case up front. Right. Do it, <clears throat> show show it, prove it. Yeah, um, and it, it also and, and, yeah. build a relationship with your filmmakers, give them what they want, deliver the things that you've at, been asking you and they will become reliant on you, they'll begin to trust you, right? And that's the thing, a lot of entertainment is really built on trust. These projects are very difficult, you know, spend more time around your coworkers than you do around your family for months at a time, right? And you want to be working with people who you wanna hang out with, you know, who are trustworthy. Like it's another thing for an artist, always tell the truth, even if you right. gotta out yourself, right? For me as a management person, my job is to help make decisions and try and make informed decisions, right? It's okay if things go wrong, things go wrong. Welcome to life, right? Yeah. I can't make a good decision if I don't actually have the facts. Yeah. So in an attempt to like not look bad or being afraid of what's gonna happen or wanting to tell somebody what they wanna hear, you're actually making their job harder. And so right. it's really just like focus on what's in your wheelhouse, tell the truth. I mean, that's kind of my job description too, is tell the truth. You know, it is what it is. Um, and then another thing I would say is, and this applies to producing as well as artists. Some people may differ. I feel like it's a terrible mistake to feel like I need to control everything. 
because you can't. There's so much of it that is totally outside of my wheelhouse, right? What the filmmaker wants, what's in his head that he hasn't communicated yet, what the studio is going to want to pay for or not, or whether or not they're getting along with the film, whatever. Um, so I don't try to control the outcome. I try to manage the process so that everybody stays fully informed. There's no surprises. Like people can deal with anything and stuff happens, let me tell you. But they don't like being surprised. And so if you are thinking forward and communicating, and this again, this applies to artists as well as management people. If you're thinking forward and communicating and avoiding surprises, you'll do fine. You know, it's okay to say, hey, this is broken. You wanted it Friday, you're not getting it until Tuesday, right? We can probably deal with that or figure out what our trade-offs are. But if you just keep your head down and keep working and hoping to make it on Friday night, you know, then everybody's like surprised when it doesn't happen. Don't do that. Tell them in advance. Right. A lot of these things sound like good um, principles for life in general. Pretty much. <laughs> I mean, yeah. there, there's no magic to it, right? Because like, there's really not much difference between this and any other job, except that, you know, the end product at the end of the day and it being publicly viewable. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, yeah, there's there's a certain component to it where, well, I guess people can be passionate about anything, which is one, wonderful, you know, that all the jobs get done in the world. I always wonder at that, the fact that everything gets done, everyone doesn't just gravitate towards one thing. But um, yeah, pe people are, are really passionate about it. And, um, you know, they start off having, I guess, dreams of what they think it's going to be like, maybe it's a little different once they get in. But um, yeah, it's. I think I always felt like it's important to keep, to keep that alive and to continue um, for me also to do some work outside of work, even though it's tough because the, you know, the hours can be so brutal sometimes, but, um, sure. but to be able to do something outside that kind of keeps your own creativity going, your own passion. Yeah, I agree. I mean, for me, it's, you know, gaming motorcycles, you know, there's certain things I do to, to turn off and not do what I do for a living. And that yeah. helps me to go back and re-engage and, you know, make it through the long days. Is there anything um, that you haven't done yet that you would love to do? Yeah. Uh, I have production managed very large, very complicated, very expensive projects. I have not produced one yet. Uh, right. and, like, and I'd like to, I'd like, I'd like the challenge. Uh, it's, it took me four or five projects as a producer to sort of find my feet and figure like, okay, uh, you know, I, I could do this. One of the things that's important to me is uh, being clear with people about what, like what I can do and what I can't do. And always keeping the project, like the project comes first. My job is to serve the project. If I feel like this project may be a little over my head, I'm not going to take it. You know, I'd love to, but I'm not there yet. And I don't want to be responsible for driving off the rails at some point just because I didn't know any better. So, uh, and I, you know what, I've completely lost the thread. I don't remember what the question was. <laughs> uh, just in, like anything for the future of your own yeah. career, you know, any ambitions that you, you have, any things you, you'd love to take on? Yeah, I would, I would love to do a large, visual effects feature. Uh, I've enjoyed my time in episodics. It's been a very interesting learning experience, but I'd like to get back to features now that COVID's, you know, not a new thing anymore. <laughs> and, um, I like how you said it's, you didn't go as far as to say it's over. <laughs> oh, uh, there's a question the, the fact that it's not. I'm sorry, I didn't yeah. hear. There's a no, question go ahead. Jackie in the chat. Uh, is it common to have multiple producers? Um, yes because there are so many flavors. One of the least well-defined job descriptions in filmmaking is producing. Right. Uh, and it can mean anything like, I'm basically a department head, right? Now, depending on the size of the project, my department could have a bigger budget than anybody else's, but it's still essentially a department head. I just stay around longer than everybody else after the shoot. There's creative producers, co-producer, associate producer, executive producer, right? An executive producer is technically somebody who's producing other producers. 
a creative person is either packaging the show. Like there's lots of different kinds. So there's always many, many producers on a show. Um, I have been on, I think, uh, Infinity Wars and Endgame, they did have essentially two visual effects producers because they were doing two movies simultaneously. And they also had two visual effects supervisors. Um, but in, in visual effects, there's generally one producer. And um, can you define the difference between production manager and producer as well while you're at it? Sure. Uh, production managing is very into the day-to-day -day details you know, uh, what's on the review schedule for today? Did we download the files? Are the coordinators ready to go? Has everybody had lunch yet? Who's working overtime this weekend? What's our, when does this deliverable have to be given off to editorial? Like all of the things, and there can be an a vast number of things. Um, and it all comes down to implementing the schedule and budget and managing the resources you've been given on the day-to-day. -day. Producing is much more um, one level of, level of abstraction up. Like I used to be able to, I, I used to have shot numbers memorized. You know, I knew what you could, you could tell me a shot number. I could tell you what was in it and what problem we were having and whether or not it was approved. Uh, now I don't pay attention to any of that. That's what the coordinators are there for. Yeah. I'm, I'm more paying attention at a more holistic level for what is the creative intent what is the director asking us to do? Not in the nitty gritty of start this action on frame 65, but this is the joke and it's not landing. We got to fix the timing. Uh, and then also I find that a lot of what I do is essentially fear management because these projects are expensive and they're high stress and people's feelings get involved. And, you know, I, I spend a lot of time either talking the studio off the ledge and saying, look, here's where we're at tell you the truth. This is the plan we have. This is when you can expect it to take, you know, start steering the, moving the needle. If it doesn't move the needle by that date, I, here's our plan B like here so that they know that somebody's watching them, you know, somebody's minding the store. Right. Um, I, I just lost the thread again. So, so, so oh. excited by the sound of my own voice. <laughs> Yeah, just really interesting, I think, because uh, um, talking about the differences between some of these things. So, like, no, I've been around this a lot um, on various different formats through TV and movies and all kinds of other things. Um, and yet, still, it can be a somewhat of a mystery uh, to me as a, having having been more on the artist side, sort of artist supervisor, um, you know, hovering over that end of it. Um, to be able to really understand what's going on and the more i've got into supervising lead supervising you know, those kinds of roles the more i'm you're obviously working directly with producers um as opposed to just coordinators or just you know only getting snippets of instruction um you're actually behind the scenes strategizing and because they're they're working with you they're trying to understand from you what really needs to get done to then be able to make a plan around it and i think it's it's really interesting to know um because i think yeah just to, to be able to have good good relationships across these departments uh, that's why i think it's really interesting to hear um your experience and your your take and your definitions of of the roles yeah because um, i think they're most misunderstood i i think that relationship building is a huge part of this and like you want to be somebody that other people want to work with right? yeah it's like a positive attitude, right? I always, I always believe, I tell people I believe in belligerent optimism. <laughs> you know, it's like, it doesn't matter what's going on. Everything's awesome and we're going to get it. We're going to get there. You know what I mean? And, and people can read that as disingenuous, but it's really not. It's really a choice to be optimistic and understand that you have options and choices and uh, you are responsible in the sense not of being at fault, but in the sense of being able to respond, whatever happens, right. whatever chaos happens, it's out of your control. I have the ability to respond. We can do A or B or C or as many other things as I can think of and trust that you'll be able to navigate through it. You know, and generally you will if you don't give yep. up.
And a lot of it, honestly, a lot of the path to producer is, especially in visual effects, is simply perseverance. Just keep, just keep doing shows, you know? And because it's about relationships, you get onto a show, you build relationships, you find people you like that are, that are competent and you want to work with again. And then you just keep doing that. And if they trust you, they'll call you again. Or when they hear somebody's looking, they'll let them know. And then you do that a bunch of times. And eventually when you help enough people, they start giving you more to do. Yep. You know, when I start a new job, one of the first things I do is I try to find somebody in the first week and help them. Doesn't matter what with. Just find a problem that's giving somebody else a headache and solve it. You know, and it's like, I'm not here to damage your process. I'm not here to just be overhead. I'm here to help. I'm from production. I'm here to help. Right. You know, and I think it sounds like a good t-shirt. Yeah. You know, and, and again, that goes back to like, don't, don't make the mistake of thinking you're in control of this or that you should be. Your job is just to monitor it and manage it and understand it and communicate about it. Avoid surprises, help people make fully informed decisions. And then the journey is going to go where it goes. Yeah. It's interesting. I've, uh, the producers I've worked with, the ones I've, like the most of what the people, the ones who have come forward with that attitude of being, you know, talking with you, not being uh, understanding that stuff goes wrong. Obviously, like you said, you've got to be clear and honest with what's actually going on so they can help. Um, cause they don't, nobody likes, uh, nasty surprises that you could have told them about earlier on. Um, but yeah, understanding, um, being there to help, being there to, to, in the, in the very beginning, I thought um, producers were were being totally honest. They were not helpful, but I think I just hadn't worked with a good one yet. And right. um, so they were more authoritative and you know, not necessarily being helpful, being fearful. And what yeah, what really um, changed it was working with a couple of good ones early on. I mean, like they would just come in and go, "How's it going? How can I help? What is there? Is there anything?" wrong would you like me to communicate anything to anyone uh do you need anything like wow this is great <laughs> yes yeah. we could do this all the time and um, i'd say i learned this from like my software development days right like when i started doing software project management i didn't know anything about software and i told the guy who hired me who's my best friend i said look i i appreciate the offer but like i didn't i know zilch about like software development lifestyles or lifestyles life cycles and he said, look, what you need to know about a software life cycle or project management school, you can read in a book or I'll send you to class. The things that make you a good producer, I cannot teach you and I cannot train anybody and I know you know how to do them. And that really comes yeah. down to personality traits of like positive attitude, communicative, even tempered, problem solving. I, I mean, I will say dealing with you as a supervisor, say, right, an artist supervisor, my plan isn't worth the paper it's written on if I wrote it, right? I have to go to the experts who are actually doing the work and say, how long is this going to take? What do you need? Do you have any concern? Like, what's your, what's the plan? You tell me how we get there because you have to do it, right? Then you write that down. Yeah. Then you flesh out a plan. And like, you know, artist's job is to create art. Management's job is to take notes, write things down, come up with project plans, like offload the administrative stuff that allows the artist to be artists. Provide that structure, but really you're writing down what the experts who know more about CG than I do will tell them, right? And then that's a realistic plan. Okay, now that realistic plan isn't gonna work because we don't have the time or the budget for it. Okay, that's cool but you have to have the realistic plan to know what trade-offs to make to scope it back down to the time and schedule you have. Okay, we can't do this. We, we can't do what they want by Friday. What can we do by Friday? And that's another thing that an artist can do. You, I try not to say no to things or we can't do that, right? You wanna provide solutions. Hey, what you're asking me to do by Friday it really isn't achievable by Friday. But here's what I can do. By Friday, I can get you these puzzle pieces. Is that enough for you to make your decision or move forward? Or could I have until Tuesday? 
right? And now it's a conversation. And right. that's way better than, well, that can't be done, right? Yeah. You're, well, okay, now what? Yeah, being solutions yeah, focused. Yeah, solu solution oriented. And also understanding that it's like, it's at the end of the day, it's not about us, right? Like I used to get super frustrated as a coordinator with like, why can't these filmmakers just make a decision and stick to it? You know? <laughs> We're noodling about this thing and it's been going on for months. And like, what is the, you know, like, really? But creative is the process of discovery. It's, right. you have an idea, you have a plan, you start down the plan and then you learn things and you go, oh, actually, you know what? This is a better idea. We actually want to go in this direction. So it's not a linear path and you're going to make detours. You're going to waste work. You're going to be asked as an artist to do things. We had a previous guy on Avatar that did at least three entire complicated previs sequences that ended up on the cutting room floor, right? But it was not a waste of effort. The filmmakers yep. needed to see that stuff to make the decisions, to understand how to tell their story, to realize they didn't need it. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, I think there's that sense of like ownership that sometimes gets in the way where you, <clears throat> you're, you're thinking that your name has to be on the credits or your pixels have to be on the final screen. Uh, like everybody in the process helps. And I think it, it takes quite a lot to kind of step over all of the rest of the, the uh, egoic stuff to be able to get there and just say like, yeah, we're all doing this. We're all in this together. Some yeah. of the people I've worked with, worked for, you know, have been been leading me. Who have had that um, approach have been the most inspiring. Where they're like, you know, someone someone fancy with a bunch of awards who has the same same kind of uh, humility or servant leadership to them is yeah very inspiring to work for as well. And I think it encourages a lot more from from the team to have yeah. that in the lead in the leadership. Yeah, I really feel like as a producer, the more people that work for me, the more people I work for. Like, right. my job is to provide you the, the resources that you need to do what I'm asking you to do and the structure and the communication to understand how it needs to be done and when, right? And then I need to get out of the way and let you do the art. And that's going to take a certain number of iterations or whatever, and then make decisions as things go. You know, up oh, this is, you know, actually... I'd love to noodle on this shot for three more weeks, but we actually need to move the artist onto the next sequence because we actually have the rest of the movie to finish. Can we CBB this? You know, and, and make those trade-offs, but always with the ultimate goal in mind, which is you have to finish the whole movie. If you only finish 90% of it, you're dead in the water, right? You have to have a credible version of every single shot, even if you don't love all of them or you don't have a movie. So how do you get everything up to an acceptable level with enough time to go back and plus up the things that are kind of stinkers, right? Because no project ever finishes. They simply rip it out of your bleeding fingers when you run out of time. Just run out of time. You run out of time and they're like, that's it, we're out. It's good to, this is the last one you're gonna get. And then, you know, and I hate it, but it's going to the movie. So I wanna ask you one last question because we're, we're uh hovering around the hour, maybe you slightly gone over. Um, anything that you're you're excited about in, in the industry or in, in the as the industry is evolving? Um, could be virtual production, but could be other stuff, you know, anything? I'm actually pretty excited about virtual production because it seems to be getting democratized. Uh, it used to be the rarefied air of $200 million plus studio features and only a few people knew how to do it, like in the sort of collective heavy iron sense. Um, and now they're using it in commercials, they're using it in episodics, they're, uh, it's specialized out into separate areas where some people do nothing but focus on the LED walls, right? Other, uh, there's still only really a few people that know how to do like heavy duty, real time motion capture with facial performance and all that stuff. But that's just because there's really not that many that have the budget, movies that have the budget to do that. So I'm, I'm super awesome. excited about vi uh, visual effects in general. Uh, the fact that it's gonna keep growing as a, as a role and take a bigger footprint of films as, as time goes on. I mean, eventually we're gonna be doing a lot of stuff in real time in Unreal and what comes out of Unreal is going in the theater. Yeah. Right? 
because it's really, uh, it's a hardware problem. If you have a fast enough processor, you can get enough iterations to make the simulation photo real, right? Yeah, yeah no, no, I, no part of me thought that we would be at real time ray tracing right now. Like, right. That's way ahead of where I thought we were, but we are. And, and like people are putting Unreal Engine projects like final output on streaming services. Like it's, yeah. you know, and it doesn't, it's not quite there yet for feature because feature just has like a higher quality bar, you know, but it's- but You can see there. again, man. Yeah, you can it, see them you know, adding hair and water simulation, or at least the result of it back yeah. in the engine. There's a lot of it's- yeah, real time cloud simulations and wind in the trees and motion in the fur and like, what what's going to happen when your Unreal Engine is running on a quantum chip, right? <laughs> like, and then like that's that's coming at some point. That's coming. And it, the things like, uh, oh, it's like there's a line from a movie called The Stuntman. Of it, you know, if if the devil could do the things we could do, he'd be a happy man. <laughs> You know, it's like there, there, there's amazing things on the on the horizon. Uh, incredible amounts of range for people to have all kinds of creative input, and really, the sky's kind of the limit. Dive in, learn how to use the tools, get excited about it, and do something cool. Um, have you? Have you? I don't know if anybody's watched um, the films that made us. It's a series on Netflix. No. It's great. It's sort of like the behind the scenes for iconic films that everybody's seen, like Back to the Future and Jurassic Park. Well, Jurassic Park, they were going to do that with animatronics. And there was one guy at ILM who was like, we can do a digital dinosaur. And everybody's like, nope, no, you can't. Phil Tippett's doing the puppets. You, uh -uh. you know, and, and he did it. And he showed it to him. And the filmmakers looked at it and said, that's what we're doing, right? And that literally changed filmmaking. Like that opened up a whole new range of possibilities, not only for the visual effects wonks, but for the filmmakers themselves. They could now tell stories about live dinosaurs and it looked good. You know? That changed my life too, because that's what made me want to get into the industry. Totally. And I ended up standing next to that guy in an elevator one day, thinking back to when I was a 13 year old kid, yeah, looking at his movie and... Um, yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, still, still happening. You know, where when you think that those innovations are kind of leveling off a bit, now we're we're back into a huge, huge time of growth again. Like you know, almost like it's the the nineties again in in terms of innovation and real yeah. times really really doing that. Yeah, uh, I work on Ghost in the Shell. I work with John Dykstra as a VFX soup, and he is cool. literally the guy who physically built the first motion control camera. You know, like, how cool is that? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so that, that's what I like about the job. There's so much stuff that happens where you're just like, wow, they pay me to do this. <laughs> you know, so I encourage people who are into it. Awesome. Well, it's been a total pleasure talking to you about it. And um, I love your, your enthusiasm and your knowledge. And it's been super, super interesting to, to have this conversation about production because as i said i think it's something which is a, a mystery to people on the other side of the fence a lot of the time and it's so important and essential and really really great to kind of understand a little bit more of the the what's going on there and the mindset and how to work well together um so yeah just want to thank you again bruce for joining us and uh, for sharing all of that with us and um sharing your your uh, wisdom and your enthusiasm and uh yeah thank you well, thank you. It's been a real pleasure. And, uh...